Yeah? Thanks, John. Um, we're drilling our third well in Ethiopia as we speak. We started the drilling. Um, God provided me with a leader there, second to none, and it was, again, a total fluke. Um, I went there just because I watched the movie that my son recommended, and God told me to go, and I went. And I met a guy, a Jewish guy who I know for 20 years there, but this guy was just driving by, a guy that he led to the Lord in, in the refugee camp in Sudan 25 years ago. And he was working for the government. And the minute I saw him, the Holy Spirit said, he's your guy. And he's in the same realm as, as Stephen Naganga and Samuel Krupanand and Arnie. And I'll show you the same realm, you know, crazy, sold out, crazy level of humility and love and mercy and legitimate holy spirit filling. I, I, can't, I can't say enough about them, you know. And we started a congregation with nothing and we have 120 new believers. Brand, brand new believers. Um, also, I want to let you know that I committed to um, another um, shoe program in some of the really poor areas of West Virginia and places like that. We're going to do a back-to-school thing. Uh, 5,000, we just ordered 5,000 pair of new shoes and 25,000. Um, which, you know, there's a Christian organization we're partner partnering with and we have our gospel tracks in there. And I noticed the last time I did this with the 20,000 pair of shoes, as I was putting the shoes on the kids, their socks were not good. So we got 25,000 pair of socks too, five pair for each pair of shoes. So we'll, we'll, show, you, we'll show you pictures um, as, as it progresses. Um, you know, I have high expectations. I have really high expectations for today. I can't begin to tell you how much time I spent. Um, I, maybe that doesn't sound right. I just, I, a lot of times when you have high expectations, um, sometimes you could live in disappointment because there's an old mathematical equation that I believe in, expectations minus reality equals disappointment. And I tend to have high expectations. I expect a lot from believers. I, I expect, I mean, people talk bad about the world. I expect nothing from the world. Amen. The world has nothing to do with me. I have nothing to do with the world. I don't expect anything from worldly people. Nothing. I don't bother talking negative about them. They are the world by definition. But, you know, true believers, I... You know, people come to my house all the time. You know what the first thing they say is? Wow, it's so clean. And I think to myself, is our house really clean or is your house dirty? <laughs> What's the big deal about having a clean house? What's the big deal about being sold out as a believer? Isn't that nominal? I mean, it's like when people say, you know what my problem is? I'm too honest. You can't be too honest. You could just be too much of a liar. God's never going to say to you, you were too honest. You were too kind. You were too compassionate. You were too giving. You took this too seriously. I don't believe it. Um, but I have high expectations, so much so that Bernadette, two years ago for Father's Day, got me a, um, a gift certificate for a suit. And I haven't bought a suit in the longest time. So I decided to use it because God said, go get the suit. And as I got the suit, um, God said, get a new shirt, get a new tie, get a new belt, get new shoes, which is like a lot for me. I really, really don't like shopping. It was really a chore. And his, then he said to me, because it's going to be a new day, and there's going to be new mercies, and I don't know exactly what that means. I, I don't really know but I'm taking my time today because I don't want to get ahead of myself and I don't want to say anything that's not of God. So um, I'm being very careful. Last Shabbat, we mentioned uh, that the Spirit would be our personal instructor, that the Spirit would help us understand God's Word, that the Spirit would serve as a gift giver and a fruit producer. 
The Spirit would give us the power to be bold, the power to fight temptation, the power to love, and the power to witness. There's a couple other things that about the Spirit and its filling that I think it's really, really important for us to discuss. And I want to show you the first screen because it says a statement on there that I want you to see. And it's the Spirit isn't a one-time deal. It must keep on filling and flowing. It's very, very important. I'm sure we could have stopped, well, it must keep on filling, but that's not true. It won't fill unless it flows. I want to show you the first verse from Ephesians. The letter was written by Paul to this congregation in Asia Minor. And the congregation, it's, it's all about, the whole letter is all about the body of Messiah. Colossians is all about Yeshua, the head. This is about us, the whole letter. And he says here in the fifth chapter, I recommend reading the whole letter, but it says, don't get drunk with wine because it makes you lose control. Instead, keep on being filled with the Spirit. So first of all, I'm, I know you've heard this before from me, but some of you may be new today or new to the last couple of weeks, and I probably haven't mentioned it in the last couple of weeks. Try not to get offended by this, but I promise you this is absolutely biblical. The Scriptures do not condemn the use of wine. Nowhere, not anywhere between Genesis and Maps does it say you can't have a drink. I mean, I know there's major denominations. Some denominations have 250 million people that teach this, but it's not scriptural. The scriptures do condemn the abuse of wine. Okay? I could go into a lesson after lesson about this. I could teach about this and use the scriptures till Yeshua comes back. It's not too hard to find the information in the Bible. Paul, though, obviously, there's nothing new under the sun. People were getting drunk back in his day. They were getting drunk before his day. They were getting drunk since the beginning of time. Did not Noah get drunk and naked? That was a long time ago. There's nothing new under the sun. But what Paul does, which is brilliant, is he recommends an alternative. See, I don't think it's good enough i i don't when i was in corporate america and there was always that guy at the meeting that go we can't do that i would always go well what can we do don't just be negative don't tell me what we can't do give me an alternative otherwise leave it alone so paul is giving an alternative he's not just saying don't get drunk with wine he says instead an alternative the alternative to being drunk with wine is being filled with the Holy Spirit. Right. Now, why does he make this comparison between intoxication and the Holy Spirit? I think because if we compare the two, we can all easily see why. Number one, in both conditions, whether you're filled with the Holy Spirit or filled with alcohol, the person is under a power outside themselves. In one case, it's the power of intoxicating Liquor, often referred to as spirits, right? Back in the day, that's what it was called, spirits. Today, we just call it alcohol, but it was called spirits. In the other case, the person is under the power of the spirit. I was going to tell you I don't know anything about being drunk. Because the fact of the matter is, whenever I was drunk, I was high as well. So I probably started drinking back in the Bronx with friends by the time I was about 12, sadly enough. And it was always excess till the time I got saved. I don't know how I graduated top of my class. I don't know how I didn't die behind a wheel because I had many car accidents and you know flipping cars and things. I don't know. I'm not proud of it. I'm just letting you know, you know, it was a crazy um, youth for me. In both conditions, whether you're filled with 
the spirits or filled with the spirit, the person is fervent, intense, and impassioned. On the day of Shavuot, the fervency produced by the spirit was so strong that it was mistaken for that produced by too much wine, remember? I'll show you a verse, Acts 2.13. This is right after they were filled and they spoke in what? Other languages, not tongues. If you look up that word tongue, it means other languages. It's much more impressive to me if I had an African come here from Kenya today who only spoke Swahili, and one of you nice little Caucasians were able to speak fluent Swahili right now, I would say, wow, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Then saying to the guy, untie your bow tie and your Hyundai. That's gibberish. Okay. But they made fun of them, right? That's what, the, that's what the other people in the temple, they were in the temple. They were, it was Shavuot. They were in the temple. Believer in Yeshua and non-believer were still worshiping together in the temple because it was still purely Jewish people. And those that started to be filled with the Holy Spirit and manifest the presence of the Holy Spirit, they just made fun of them. They said, look, they're wasted. And that's when Peter stood up and said, it's five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> no, that's silly. He didn't do it. John, no. <laughs> no, Peter explained to them. Yeah. No, and then he gave a soul-stirring, yeah. spirit-filled sermon like none other. Like none other. Going back to Ephesians 5.18 for a minute, again, in both conditions, the person's walk is effective. It's affected. I spent a good number of time doing security work on concerts in Manhattan and working at bars. I can tell you um, that when a person is very drunk, his physical walk is affected. In the case of the spirit, a person's moral walk is affected. Here's where they differ. In the case of drunkenness, there is always, and I repeat, always a strong desire for sensual pleasures and a lack of moral restraint. Why do you think these young girls that go away to spring break and they get wasted, why do you think they do things there that they don't do things at home? It's not because their parents aren't with them. It's not because they're in a different locale. They're drunk. And their guard is down. In other words, when you're drunk, you go hog wild. The Spirit's filling never produces these. In the case of drunkenness, there is loss of self-control. But God tells us in His Word that the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. So when you see people out of control in the church and they claim they're under the influence, they're under the influence, but it's not the Holy Spirit, it's a familiar spirit. Sometimes in the Bible, the filling with the Spirit seems to be presented as a sovereign gift of God. For instance, Yochanan the Immersa, a.k.a. John the Baptist, was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. It tells us that in the book, of, the book of Luke. In such a case, the person receives the Spirit without any prior conditions that need to be met. It is not something for which he works for or prays for. The Lord just gives it sovereignly as he pleases. Here in Ephesians 5.18, the believers commanded, not suggested, this is God through the Apostle Paul commanding us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It involves action on our part. He must meet certain conditions. It is not automatic, but the result of obedience. For this reason, the Spirit's filling should be distinguished from other of the Spirit's ministries. Now, I don't want to make this too academic by no means, and I do not have all the answers. However, there are three other aspects of the Holy Spirit that is different from the present progressive being filled, as it's stated in Ephesians 5.18. Number one, you've heard this, the indwelling, right? People throw around these terms, but i got to tell you, they have no idea what it means. <laughs> it's scary when I hear them explain it. 
and how they interchange things. So when we talk about the indwelling, this comes from John 14, 16. Yeshua himself said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforting counselor, speaking about the Holy Spirit, like me, the Spirit of truth to be with you forever. By this ministry, the comforter takes up his residence in the body of the believer and empowers him or her for holiness, worship, and service. It happens once you're saved. Don't let anybody tell you different. It's poppycock, and it's not biblical. Number two, you've heard the anointing. How many people are confused with that term? Oh, he's anointed. Is he not anointed? Two born-again believers, and that one's anointed, and that one's not? Oh, Rabbi Greg, you're so anointed. You're not? 1 John 2.27 says this. As for you, that's you. The messianic anointing you received from, you received from the Father remains in you so that you have no need for anyone to teach you. The Spirit Himself is the anointing who teaches the child of God the things of God. That should clear up some things for you, hopefully. And last but not least, you've heard about the guarantee and the seal. Ephesians 1, 13, 14, it says, Furthermore, you who have heard the message of the truth, the gospel, the good news offering you deliverance, and put your trust in the Messiah, saved, okay? Saved. Were sealed by him with the promised Ruach HaKodesh, with the Holy Spirit, who guarantees our inheritance until we come in the possession of it, talking about heaven, talking about the new heavens and the new earth, and thus bring him praise commensurate with his glory. In other words, Paul is saying here that the Holy Spirit guarantees the inheritance for the saint. If, you ha if you're born again and you have the Holy Spirit, you are guaranteed this inheritance, okay? Nobody could take it from you. No decay, no enemy, no demon. It's yours. Okay? If you fall short one day, it's not removed from you. And as the seal... He guarantees the saint for the inheritance. So he guarantees the inheritance for the saint and the saint for the inheritance. You follow? These, meaning the indwelling, the anointing, and the guarantee and the seal, these are some of the ministries of the Spirit which are realized in the person the moment they are saved. Let nobody teach you any different, class. This is Believership 101. This is b very basic kindergarten theology. Everyone who is in Yeshua automatically has the indwelling, the anointing, the guarantee, and the seal at the time of their salvation. Do you hear me? Breaks my heart when people are taught, well, I have to pray for it. I didn't get it. Then you're not saved. No, I am saved. Then you got it. We'll get into that in a minute, okay? The filling, though, is different. The filling is different. It is not a once-for-all crisis experience in the life of the disciple. Rather, it's a continuous process. The literal translation of the command in Ephesians, right from the Greek into English, straight up, is be being filled with the Spirit. That is present progressive grammar. Be being. Be being right now and future. It may begin as a crisis experience, but it must continue thereafter as a moment-by-moment -moment process. The reason it is present progressive is because today's filling will not do for tomorrow's needs. It's like the manna. It was there for one day. You couldn't collect it for the next day. It turned into worms. Each day, you got to go for it. In fact, in fact, continually being filled with the Spirit is the ideal condition for the believer on earth. It means that the Holy Spirit is having His way relatively ungrieved in the life of the believer. And that the believer is therefore fulfilling his role in the plan of God for that time. Do you follow? 
here's a good question you may want to ask. If I were you and I was sitting out there, I would definitely ask this, so I'll ask it for you. How can a believer be filled with the Holy Spirit? We know that the indwelling, the anointing, the guarantee, and the seal is a given. Now, how do I get this Holy Spirit? You know, when we spoke the first week on Shavuot, we spoke about its fulfillment in the Holy Spirit. Good information. I get it. Good. And then last week we spoke about all that the Holy Spirit has to offer. Fantastic. Now, how do I get it, Rabbi? How do I get it? Because without knowing how to get it, you might not get it. And if you don't get it, what's the point of talking about those other things? Number one, we must confess and put away sin. Now, I'm going to set the bar very high, which is usually what I do. Because I know we're humans, me, myself included, of course, and I know we never reach the bar. So I think it's just important to set it high, knowing that we'll probably fall short, okay? But we must confess and put away sin. 1 John 1.9 says, if we acknowledge our sins, and you guys know this probably verbatim, then since he is trustworthy and just, he will forgive them and purify us from all wrongdoing. It is obvious to me, not just in my experience, but reading the Bible, that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, cannot work freely in a life where sin is condoned. We have to drag the sin out in the light. Drag it out. Don't let it hide. And agree with God and call it for what it is. Lawless acts against His Word. Now, I am talking about sin as a lifestyle, not intermittent sin. So don't get nervous. I'm talking about a person walking in sin. A lifestyle of sin. I don't mean that they sin all the time. You're going to sin every day, so I'm not referring to that. I'm talking about doing something that you know is absolutely sinful and you just keep doing it thinking that God's okay with it. You've convinced yourself that he's okay. I'm here to tell you the devil has deceived you. Also, it is important to make note that true confession of sins involves forsaking those sins. Let me show you one verse in Proverbs 28, 13. It says, he who conceals his sins will not succeed. They will not prosper. He who confesses and abandons them will gain mercy. We have to confess them to God and to anyone who has been wronged. You cannot just make your confession to God. That's why Yeshua said, if you've wronged your brother and you come to worship me, I'm sorry. Leave the gift of worship. I can't receive your worship. Go to your brother and confess your sins to that brother. Once you do that, whether he or she forgives you or not, then you can come before me and worship. Confession alone doesn't do it. We have to abandon those sins. The word abandon in the Hebrew means to divorce, to divorce oneself from them. So I guess it's safe to say God hates divorce unless it's from our sins. On a side note, when we confess our sins, we must believe on the authority of the Word of God that He forgives us. And if He forgives us, we have to be willing to forgive ourselves. Once forgiven, we give ourselves once again over to God, which brings us to number two. We must yield ourselves completely. Now that's a big, I told you the bar is high. Completely to its control, as completely, I guess, as we can. Romans 12, 1 through 2, at the end of this magnificent theological letter, Paul says, and again, you are very familiar with these verses. I exhort you, Therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercies, in view of chapters 1 through 11, and all God has done for us, offer yourselves as a sacrifice, living and set apart for God. This will please Him. We, if you want to know what pleases Him, this will do it. 
It's logical. It makes sense based on all he's done. It's not theological, just logical. In other words, do not let yourselves be conformed to the standards of the Olam Hazeh, this world. This involves surrender, which so many of us struggle with. Surrendering our will, our decision maker. Surrendering our intellect, it's a tough one. Surrendering our body. Our time, our treasures, our talents, and the list goes on. Every area of our life must be thrown open. Don't close off anything. Open yourself up to the Spirit's control. You might say, Rabbi, I'm very closed. I can open up 10%. Well, that's 10% more than you were doing. You know, it all starts with the first step. Anything in the right direction is good stuff as far as your rabbi is concerned. But you've got to give him the helm of the ship. The yoke of the plane, the wheel of the car. I know it's not easy to give up and surrender. Most of us struggle with it. I've had guys, special forces and Navy SEALs watch. And they write to me and they said, we don't know how to surrender. We're taught to never, ever surrender. They're a different breed. I don't know if you've ever met these guys, but they're not regular people. They're, they're, they have a supernature about them. If they have teeth in their mouth and no arms and no legs, they'll fight you and bite you. They don't have, they're programmed. They're damaged goods. They don't know how to quit. It's not doable for them. You know how hard it is for them to become believers, to surrender their life to God? Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. The world system is totally and in every other way antagonistic to the kingdom of God. And the God of this world is Satan himself. The world has its own politics. It has its own art forms. Its own music. Its own religion its own amusements, its own thought patterns, its own lifestyles, and it seeks to get everyone to conform to its culture and its customs. And we're obviously seeing that today more than ever because we're getting close. The world system is what man has built in order to make himself happy without God. In fact, it instructs and it influences people to believe there is no God. Lastly, the world hates, and I mean hates, nonconformists. We are nonconformists. You want to be cool and be part of a subculture? Then be a real believer. And the more we think the way God thinks, the more we nonconform. How does God think? Let me recommend you read your Bibles and find out. And if we obey what we read, then we shall experience the guidance of God in our lives. And don't tell me you've read the Bible through and through six years ago. You're making a mistake. Which brings me to number three. We must let the word of God richly dwell in us. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of the Messiah in all its richness live in you as you teach and counsel each other in all wisdom. This involves reading, studying, and obeying what we read. As we saturate our hearts and minds with His Word and seek to obey it, then the Word of Messiah will make a home in our hearts. When the Word of God dwells in us, 
the Spirit of God has to flow out of us. We all have the responsibility to teach and counsel one another in wisdom. When teaching and counseling are given over to wisdom, they are more likely to find acceptance than when we speak with force, without wisdom, and without love. I think the term down here in the South was called Bible thumpers. Anybody familiar with that? I never knew what that meant till I moved down here. Being filled with the Spirit and being filled with God's Word are both requisites. Requisites for living joyful, useful, fruitful lives. We shall not be filled with the Spirit unless we are saturated with God's Word. And the study of God's Word will not be effective unless we yield up our inmost being to the control of the Holy Spirit. It is a day-by-day feeding on the Scriptures, meditating on them, obeying them, and living by them, which brings us to our last point, point number four. We must be emptied of self. Galatians 2.20 says, When the Messiah was executed on the stake as a criminal, I was too, so that my proud ego no longer lives. But the Messiah lives in me. And the life I now live in my body, I live by the same trusting faithfulness that the Son of God himself had, who loved me and gave himself up for me. You guys know this all too well. In order to be filled with a new ingredient, a cup must first be emptied of the old. To be filled with him, we must be emptied of us. I've told you this before, I was very involved after playing, you know, the traditional sports, basketball, football, and baseball. I got very involved in martial arts in college and continued on for many years. It's, um, it's a religion when you get deep involved in it. With that being said, of course, you know, one of my heroes was Bruce Lee. And Bruce Lee would, once he got famous, he would have a lot of famous people come in Hollywood to be his student. And they would bring him all kinds of money, and they would also bring him their accolades. Bruce Lee would always say, so tell me about yourself. And boy, people love to talk about themselves. And they talked about how they studied this art and that art under this person, that person. They were very full of themselves. And Bruce Lee said, I can't teach you anything. I'm sorry. And they said, what happened? And they said, I can't fill your cup, Bruce Lee said unless you first empty it. Same principle. Same principle. It is not that the believer does not cease to live as a personality. All of you guys in here have very different scripts. Yes, we're human, and yes, we are connected because we've all suffered, and we've all had pain, we've all had childhoods, we all know what it is to laugh. But let me tell you something. There are no two people that are even similar. We are very distinct, like snowflakes. There's not two snowflakes the same, even with the billions of snowflakes that fall in a snowstorm, because we've all had a different script. So I don't want to try to change your script. Only God can. But sometimes, I know for me, I'm, I have definite... I'm obsessive. I've been obsessive my whole life. Very, very obsessive. Not obsessive compulsive where I have to wash my hands a hundred times. In fact, I need to wash my hands more. But with that being said, obsessive about when I find something that I believe is true or good, I'm all in. You ask my wife, and I mean all, I don't mean 99% in. And so I've been like this my whole life. Once I found God, which is the truth, but... Sometimes being obsessive is dangerous. You know, being under my tutelage for 20 years, it could be a little dangerous at times. Because I set the bar so high, because I'm so obsessive, I don't know if that's normal or necessary per se. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not really totally sure. But I do know that we don't cease to live as a personality 
or as an individual. But the one who is seen by God as having died is not the same as the one who now lives. I'm, I don't know about you. I don't know about your experience. When I got born again, I dropped everything. I dropped the recreational drugs. I dropped the drinking. I stopped the sleeping around. I dropped it all. It was very radical for me. So that's all I know is radical. That's my normal. Radical. And my mom would say, I, I, can't, I can't tell the old ladies in the building, Greg, what you're doing. They would, they would have a stroke. Certain of my old friends couldn't believe it. They thought, what, what's, what's the... What's the catch? Like, what, what's... It's not a matter of striving, though, which we all, I think, fall prey to, but of trusting. We live a holy life not out of fear of punishment, but out of love to the Son of God who loved us and gave himself up for us. Just for the record, this is a personal struggle of mine as I tend to want to prove my worth to my wife, to my kids, and especially to my God. It's not malicious or sinful. It's just incredibly stressful. And my recommendation to you is don't do it give up the control daily and I repeat daily here's another good question that you may want to ask so if you feel like asking it I'll just ask it for you can a person know if and when they are filled and the answer is oh yeah oh yeah actually the closer we are to the Lord the more we are conscious of our own complete unworthiness and sinfulness. It's, it's such a dichotomy, isn't it? It's, it's like a mind twister. Yeah. Rabbi, here you're telling me that God loves us unconditionally, but the closer we get to this unconditional love, the more we feel unworthy. How could I feel so full of sin and so loved at the same time? You can. You absolutely can. And you should. Let me read a couple of verses that I wasn't going to read. But I got some orders now. Isaiah was the prophet of prophets. Nobody had a longer ministry of prophecy, over 40 years. I mean, he walked around naked with his butt exposed. He was not well liked. And that was his whole life. It wasn't like some of the other minor prophets who had one little quick prophecy. This was his life. And he was born in royalty. He, he, he had a wonderful life that he gave up. I don't know if you're aware of that. And he spoke more about the Messiah in his prophecy than all the prophets, major and minor, put together. This is what he said in chapter 6. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw Adonai sitting on a high lofty throne. The hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphim stood over him, each with six wings, two covering the face, two covering the feet, and two for flying. They were crying out to each other, more holy than the holiest holiness is Adonai Sivaot, the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. The doorposts shook at the sound of their shouting, and the house was filled with smoke. Then I said, woe to me, I'm doomed. We have a very high opinion of ourselves. I think you need to meet the Lord on a regular basis. Because I am a man with unclean lips, living among a people with unclean lips. I don't think my lips are any more unclean than yours and vice versa. Because I've seen with my own eyes the king, Adonai Tzivaot. And look at his resume. How did he do with his life and living his life for the Lord? 
it's not a bad thing. In his presence, we find nothing in and of ourselves to be proud of. Do, do you hear me? In his presence. Now, I'm not here to judge, but I'm saying some people don't get in his presence much. They just don't. They don't experience that. I'm not being a big shot, but I try to get in his presence daily. Bar none. In his presence, we find nothing in and of ourselves to be proud of. Personally, I don't feel spiritually superior to any of you or anyone for that matter. I don't. It's the truth. In fact, I very rarely think of myself of any great consequence at all. I also never feel like I've arrived. Never. Never. The fact of the matter is that the believer who is filled with the Spirit is occupied with Messiah, not himself. But at the same time of being occupied with the Messiah, he or she realizes that it is God who is working in and through his or her life. We see things happening in a supernatural way. Circumstances click miraculously. Lives are touched, powerfully touched for God. Events move according to a divine timetable. We see all this, and yet at the same time, we feel strangely detached from it all as far as taking any credit is concerned. In our inmost being, we realize it's all the Lord. One last point. You don't have to be extraordinary to receive the Spirit. Look at Acts 4.13. When they saw, these are the religious leaders, and I'm not making fun of them, they were trying their best to lead the people. When they saw how bold Kepha, that is Peter, and Yochanan, that is John, I just want you to understand, they were 100% Jewish and they stayed 100% Jewish. When they saw how bold they were, even though they were untrained Amharets, those are regular people of the land, they were amazed. The rulers and the leaders in Israel recognized something very different about these guys. Ordinarily, they would have brushed them off and just dismissed them as nobodies. Why? They were unlearned. They were uneducated, ordinary people. But when they saw just how bold they were, after scurrying, they were blown away. They, they couldn't, it defied logic. Here's the deal, guys. Dry, formal religion is ever intolerant of enthusiastic, vital evangelism that produces results in hearts and lives of others. I have met more believers that give me a hard time than the world ever gave me. And to be frank with you, it's out of their lousy little petty jealousy that they're sitting on their hands and I'm trying to make them look bad because of their non-involvement in the faith. I'm not trying to make them look bad. I could care less. I'm trying to proclaim the great gospel of the kingdom of heaven. A man may be highly talented, intensively trained, and widely experienced, but without spiritual power, it's worthless. On the other hand, a man may be uneducated, unattractive, and run refined, but let him be clothed with the power of the Holy Spirit and watch out. Acts 4.18 it says, so they called them in again and ordered them, under no circumstances 
Are you to speak or teach in the name of Yeshua? They forbid them, Peter and John, and then to talk to the other disciples. Tell them, you can't talk about Yeshua in private conversation or to preach Him publicly. We forbid it as your leaders. Acts 4, 19, 20. Last two verses. It says, But Kepha and Yochanan answered, You must judge whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God. As for us, we cannot help talking about what we have actually seen and heard. There was no way they could agree to that as their loyalty and devotion and responsibility was to God, not man. They did not say, we will not. You see what I italicized? It wasn't a matter of choice, but fact. This is something God told me years ago. I must tell you, I know you see me sometimes as very Generalissimo Francisco Franco-ish. I know. And I know sometimes you're thinking, who is he? he th does he think he's a dictator? And why does he say if, if we wanted to leave that, that he's not concerned? If that was our choice, that's okay. That he wouldn't run after us and beg us. He doesn't seem like a good pastor. Well, let me explain something to you guys, okay? For the first 10 years I was here, I was dealing with a horrific crew. Some of you are here long enough, and you will amen that. They were hypocritical. They were difficult. They were jealous. They weren't encouraging. They wanted to break me and my family down. It was the typical, it was the quintessential, I should say, the quintessential biblical prophet Jezebel Ahab deal. It was as quintessential as anything I've ever seen, and I could tell the Jezebel spirit from a mile away, I'm just telling you. Quintessential Elijah, Jezebel, you couldn't get any more. And it almost killed me. I found myself many times in the cave, just like Elijah. It was a horrible 10 years. Broke me down, it got me sick, I didn't sleep, caused depression. So if you're wondering why, I'm explaining to you. I'm explaining to you my script before you're so quick to judge. But this is what God taught me, and I will never unlearn this lesson. To inoculate me from the praise of man, God baptized me in the criticism of man until I died to the control of man. I know it sounds hard, but I must protect myself from being controlled by anything or anyone except the Spirit of God. I choose to get the applause of heaven. The bottom line is this. The disciples weren't able to stop and neither should you. To me, it's like telling a bird to stop flying or a fish to stop swimming. Birds fly, fish swim, believe his witness, period. Yeshua said the following words towards the end of his ministry, quote, Yes, indeed, I tell you that whoever trusts in me will also do the works I do. Indeed, he will do greater ones because I'm going to the Father. Of course, he was referring to sending the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, we read about the apostle performing miracles of bodily healing, similar to those of Yeshua. But we also read of greater miracles, such as the saving of 3,000 souls on the day of Shavuot. Doubtless, it was to the worldwide proclamation of the gospel, the salvation of so many souls, and the building up of the body of Messiah that the Lord referred to by the expression, greater works. I ask people, young people, old people sometimes, so what God, what's God telling you? What? And they always talk about themselves and what God's doing for them and what God's saying to them and how God's healing them. And you know what I tell them? I only care about two things. Only two things. 
soul saved, and Yeshua's return. That's the end of my story. It is greater to save souls than to heal bodies. And it is by the power of the Holy Spirit that this was and still is accomplished. Here's some humble Rabbi Greg advice for you, family. Just as you have left the whole burden of your sin and have rested on the finished work of Messiah, so leave the whole burden of your life and service and rest upon the present indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Give yourself up morning by morning to be led by the Spirit and go forth leaving Him to manage you and your day. Cultivate the habit of joyfully depending upon and obeying Him, expecting Him to guide you, to enlighten you, to teach you, and to use and do in with you what He wills. Count upon the working as a fact, altogether apart from sight or feeling. Let us believe in and obey the Holy Spirit as the ruler of our lives. And let us cease from the burden of trying to manage ourselves. Then and only then the fruit of the Spirit shall appear in us in all glory to God. I spent three uninterrupted days. Bernadette was away. My kids are ridiculously independent. I spent three days away from everybody and everything. I didn't come in. And then I came out of those three days. And I felt so impressed to pray for you. And if I'm wrong, then I apologize. But there were three areas. One was for you to surrender. We struggle to surrender, and you know why? It stems from anxiety. We're so afraid and fearful that we can't let go of the wheel. We have to control the situation because we're so afraid that if we don't, it's going to get out of control. Is there anybody in this sanctuary that knows what I'm talking about? Okay. If you don't admit this and it's not a terrible thing, God cannot deliver you. He will not deliver you. It is not automatic. Forgiveness is not automatic. Number two, I was asked to pray for you to be released from perfectionism. Is there anybody that knows what that is? Don't be embarrassed. Raise your hand and stop making like you have it together. You're not going to get delivered. You're going to stay. Some of you are so sick and mentally and emotionally ill that it's become your standard and you think you're okay. Because you're not as crazy as the real crazy person. But it's not good. You're driving yourself crazy and you're driving everybody around you crazy. And it's not good. And this is a day of deliverance. Don't come here to sing songs and hear a message. Listen to me. The reason we are perfectionists is either we weren't loved, so we're trying to prove ourselves, or we were loved so much that the standard that was set for us was so high, it's impossible for us to reach it. And the third area is forgiving ourselves, which is a cousin to perfectionism. We set such a high standard for ourselves that we can't reach it. So we're constantly feeling condemned. And then the sphere of our responsibility is so huge that every time there's a problem, we just blame ourselves. If, if, if Bernadette does something wrong, it's not her fault, it's my fault. If the kids do fall short, it's not her, their fault, it's my fault. If the synagogue doesn't do well, it's my fault. If a marriage falls apart and I marry them, it's my fault. I, I do this. I do this. I need to have control because my life was so out of control. And I'm the ultimate perfectionist. It's never good enough. It's never good enough. And as far as forgiving myself, nobody can replay small aspects of guilt better than yours truly. And nobody can blame himself for everything and anything. It's poison. 
Rabbi, why don't you fix yourself? I'm in process. Why do you think I stay so close to God? We are mentally and emotionally damaged. It doesn't make us horrible people. I don't consider myself a horrible person. No. But I want to be free. And I don't mind blaming myself when I fall short. But it's a horrible thing blaming myself for when other people fall short. It's a horrible thing making my sphere of responsibility so huge that it's almost like Yeshua's sphere of responsibility. And if I keep this perfectionist mentality, then I can never be totally happy because there's no such thing as perfection. When the Bible says be perfect, it means mature. So, I guess what I'm saying is after 20 years, I've pushed hard. Um, be careful how hard you push yourself. It could cause a person to be unhappy and miss some of the beautiful things that God is doing in them and through them. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Now, um, if you need to go, by all means, you can go. Um, I won't be able to say the ironic benediction over you, but there's a beautiful benediction in the New Testament that I'm supposed to share with you, and it's this. May the grace of the Lord Yeshua, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. If you are really struggling with those three things, and I don't mean Rabbi Greg's going to pray, so what the heck do I got to lose? I don't mean that. If you're really struggling, I would like to ask you to come forward so I can pray over you because that's what I was instructed to do. And I got to tell you something. I don't know why this happens. When I pray for myself, nothing happens. And when I pray for other people, a lot happens. It's kind of crazy. I can get jealous at times. So I'll pray for somebody to be healed and they'll be healed. And I'll be like, God, I've been sick for 20 something years. Like, why can't just doesn't work out that way for me. I don't say that to get you to jump up and go, well, if he's praying, then if he says that he's going to, people are going to, I'm saying that this perfectionism, this not being able to forgive yourself, it's gone on for too long. Some of you, I know you, you've cried to me 20 years ago and you're still crying now. It's too much. What was done in the past was done. Leave it alone. You're not the same as you used to be. You are not the same. You are growing. Stop putting this crazy, crazy burden on yourself and stop putting it on everybody else. We're not all just running in deception and praising the devil. I know a lot of you very well. You have tried very hard. You've made your life somewhat of a sacrifice for God. Homeschooling your kid, raising your kids in the way, look, crying over your kids, praying and fasting. That's huge. There is only one Messiah, and you are not him.